Welcome, everyone, to the April episode of the Broker Breakdown. A little bit of a difference again this month. We got our office painted, so it looks a little bit different from last month. The jerseys are back up on the wall, so that's a nice little touch. And guess what? It is our second year anniversary. The Broker Breakdown has been around for two years now. So I am super excited to thank everyone for supporting us over the last two years. I know we've gone from basically just being audio for the longest time, realistically, only since really the last few months have we gone to video. But all the support we've seen over all of our socials has been super, super impactful for us to continue moving forward and putting out content. So I want to thank everyone for that. And a guest star that has been on the podcast before, just over a year ago now, I want to welcome back Alex. Alex, what's going on? Not too much. Thanks again for having me on. And congrats on the two years. It's a huge milestone. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It's like I said, it's been uh it's an up and down journey, a lot of, you know, learning yeah. curves, obviously, because doing a podcast is uh, a little bit out of my realm. I'm not the most creative person of all time. So uh, <laughs> the kind of, you know, learn some new life skills in the last two years by doing this has been sure. uh, really rewarding. And again, thank you for taking your time. I know you did last year for us and you're doing it yeah. now for us again. So I'm really happy for you to be on again. Absolutely. I think our conversations have been really fruitful. So uh Building on that and everything that's changed is just going to add more value to to the listeners. So exactly. definitely thanks for having me on. Exactly. Do you want to kind of, you know, maybe jog people's memory of who you are? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Alex Late. I'm a uh, mortgage agent in Hamilton, Ontario with Tried and True Mortgages. And basically we help Canadians or uh, homeowners get mortgages, uh, apply for new mortgages. In, and we can do this in Hamilton and all across Ontario and in, even in some other provinces as well. So you might be looking for a mortgage to buy a new home. You might be looking to refinance your mortgage. You might be looking to renew your mortgage. We help with all those things, and we work with over 73 different lenders to be able to get you approved. Nice. And, uh, yeah, a little bit about me. Um, we run a monthly newsletter as well. We put a lot of content out on social media. If you want to check any of that out, we have our YouTube channel as well, where James has been a, been a guest as well. So. And a piece of that content I want to bring up right away is this kind of bond theme that you have here. So do you want to explain <laughs> that a little bit? Because I was telling you about this sure. the other day that I yeah. actually really enjoyed because from just a rather regular consumer standpoint, like uh -huh. I never really knew this information that I've, again, from mm -hmm. introducing myself to you and getting to know you a little bit, you've been, you just started, I know you just, not recently, but in the last, I think 12 months you've been doing this. And it's been really engaging for myself to be like, oh, this is actually like really intriguing information to take a, like to know about when it comes to mortgages. For sure. So, yeah, it's uh, you're right. It's just been probably the last six months. And so the main question we always get and pretty much everyone is talking about when you're talking about mortgages or real estate is what are the current interest rates? And so what I thought was, well, why don't I on a daily basis, Monday to Friday, put out the factors that are affecting the interest rates that day. And generally speaking, when you're thinking about fixed interest rates, you're going to be talking about the bond yields. So there's five-year bond yields, three-year bond yields, 10-year and more. I just generally show the five and three-year bond, um, but just a little, add a little bit of spice to it, uh, changed up a bit. We started calling it the James bond yield update. <laughs> and so um, I do this every day on, on our Instagram and Facebook story. And basically, I, I post a picture of what the bond yield is, or the James bond yield, and then I give a quick breakdown of what's affecting the bond yield that day and where we predict it's going to go later on in the week. And if you don't know, uh, the bond yields directly affect fixed interest rates. I just mentioned that a little bit before. So whatever the bond yield is, you can add a little bit of a premium, or that's what the lenders do at least. And that's how they end up with their fixed rates. So I try to I try to make it as simple as possible because bond yields aren't you know the sexiest the most thing. To talk about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When I first saw it, I was like, "What's this guy talking about? Like this stuff is like I've never heard of this term before ever." And then, like I said, since you started doing it, I looked into it a little bit more, and like yeah. I've been I follow every post, and I'm like, "Oh, like that clearly is impacting what the bond yields doing now." So even that's just right. from someone that's just a regular consumer like myself, it's been a very easy guide to go oh like this is what's really impacting it right now and it's you know it's kind of nice to see almost in a 
I wouldn't say a dumbed down term, but yep. you're making it very easy for consumers to look at it and go, oh, this is what is actually going on. That's right. That's right. And generally speaking, there are one or two things a day you can pinpoint that are affecting the bond yields and the market in, in, in general. So that's why I like to do it. Yeah. No, and I, like I said, from a consumer standpoint, I think it makes it really easy to see, you know, in a very easy term of, hey, this is what's going on and this is why it's being impacted. So I, again, kudos to you because like I said, even Thank just you. for myself, it's been very impactful for me. And I've told people, hey, you know what? Like if you guys really want a great like explanation of it, go check these guys out because they explain it very, very well. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. It, it, it all comes down to um, uh, what it, what's the saying? Knowledge is power. Yep. And if you are looking for a mortgage right now, or if you're looking for a mortgage in the future, knowing what the bond yields are, knowing what the interest rates are, can have a huge impact. And not only that, but I, I mention this from time to time in, on the bond yields every day. The bond yields give us a, a short glimpse into the future because what a lot of them are is the market's pricing in what they think is going to happen. And so let's say you see a spike in the bond yields. Maybe they think some data later that week is going to come out and then be bad. If they're starting to decrease, maybe they think there's some good data going to come out. And so you can sort of uh, uh, predict using the bond yields. It's obviously not 100% full roof. Nothing is but it gives us a little bit of insight into the future. And that's why I like to do it as well, because then we can also advise our clients properly and say, look, you can wait off on your application or you can wait off on buying or this or that, but just so you know, this is what the market is sort of telling us they think is going to happen. Yeah, it's same with insurance, right? Like we can yep. predict all we want on our side too, but again, we see the kind of patterns and you know the trends that are going on in our industry and the insurance sure. companies then make you know, predictions of what might happen in the next quarter, two quarters, next 12 months, right? So right. again, it's not always perfect. There's times where I'm, you know, praising them at the top of the mountain because of their predictions. And other times I'm damning them at the bottom of the mountain because I'm like, oh, their predictions <laughs> are so wrong. And now look at yep. where we are, right? Which unfortunately is kind of the situation we're in now is with the markets being so restrictive and, you know, mm. you know, like we are in a really tough market right now. And sure. again, I I saw patterns of a year ago, 18 months ago, where I was like, this is not going to be good. They're not seeing this. Like, why are they not, you know, making this more of an important topic to be discussing? And, you know, sure. now we found ourselves in more of a restricted and hard market, which again, obviously sucks for consumers and myself. But mm -hmm. again, predictions are never perfect. It just, no, that's what they sure. were hoping were going to happen. Unfortunately, it kind of took a different path, right? Absolutely. And, and, from our point of view on the mortgage side, obviously we're dealing directly in real estate. These are good things to know that you tell us, like, and you always keep me up to, up to date with that because we need to be able to inform our borrowers, especially like investor borrowers, when things do become a little bit more restricted, these could potentially be some extra costs or you might not even be able to get the insurance you thought you could. Um, I guess one thing I was going to ask you, so what are causing all of these restrictions in the tighter, tighter market on the insurance side? Um, the, the, the biggest one just mostly being profitability. So a mm. lot of companies, 2023 reports came out, profitability was very, very low, lower than they actually, they knew it was going to be low just based on what sure. was going on in the market from last year, but they were lower yep. than what a lot of companies were expecting. So right there and then that's a big red flag to a lot of insurance companies. They go, whoa, whoa, mm. whoa, wait a second. Like we got to pump the brakes a little bit here because our profitability is very, very low. Mm -hmm. And we need to do something about it. Again, there's mm -hmm. other factors too. Like again, maybe not from the home side of things, but sure, auto thefts. Auto thefts were a continuous problem last year. Yep. In the auto world, again, insurance companies try to combat it. Government policies, sort of. Um, mm -hmm. Manufacturers, not really a whole lot of movement there from mm -hmm. their side of things. So mm -hmm. again, that correlates back to the profitability issue is that they were paying out so much in just auto theft claims yep. not only just anything else obviously there's other claims too um and then thirdly just being weather related claims again something i've been like beating like a dead animal a with yep. a stick realistically it's just like <laughs> hey like this is it's continuously happening. We're seeing our environment change so much. And with that change is that we're seeing things happen that we've never seen before, right? Like sure. over the last five years, like look how many windstorms we've had. Like, mm. yes, windstorms happened before, but at this 
rate never before. So insurance companies are having to pay out more on that. They're paying out more on water. Last year in fire claims, just from like wildfires, they're paying out <laughs> so much money, right? So this is impacting everyone and every company out there. It's not just one company that's taking the brunt force of this. Every sure. insurance company is having these issues. And again, from the predictions, yeah. how did they align themselves long-term? Some companies were really good at it and other yep. companies were really poor at it. So it's just... What, when it, go ahead. Sorry. Cut no, go ask your question. When it comes to homeowners, then what, I guess, what's the best route for them to go? Because you can't predict if you're going to have a fire or a windstorm is going to blow off your shingles or not. Because when we're advising, obviously we don't advise on home insurance, but clients will ask us from time to time, what do you think I should do? And whenever the lenders ask to see a home insurance policy, what they tell us they need is they need a guaranteed replacement cost yep. of at least the value of the home or more. And so I'm mean, obviously it's going to increase your premium because you're getting a larger uh, replacement cost, but I guess, is there any way to, to save on that? Um, again, it's, it's very hard to say, Hey, you know what? Like this is going to, cause again, insurance is for accidents and accidents. They happen. Like we can't stop these things from happening, but it's also doing as much as possible to mitigate these things from happening. Right? Like if you're, for example, if you have a wood stove and you just pile a big wood arch over your wood stove, well, you're not really stopping a fire from happening because you're almost like increasing the risk of it happening because you just have all this wood and debris around it, right? So again, if you're mitigating as much as possible and it still happens, there's really nothing we can do about that. However, also from the broker side of things, a good broker is going to align you not only short-term, but long-term with a company that actually is really going to meet your needs and benefits of having a policy. Every, I, I always make sure people are aware of this everyone's policies, at least to me, is never the same cookie cutter mold because everyone has their own needs and like surpluses that they are going to need on their policy, depending on what they have. For example, myself, I have a ton of sporting equipment. I golf, I fish, you know, I have that stuff. And people are very unaware of that. You know what? Like if you have a lot of, you know, sporting equipment, and I did a video sure. on this uh, a few weeks ago, but your insurance company or insurance policy actually only has a very limited amount of coverage unless you increase that coverages. I see. But again, yep. people don't, again, do you really look at your insurance policy and go, Oh my God, like I don't have enough for my golf clubs. Probably That's not right. because you just, yeah. you, it's just not something you think of. Right. But That's from right. an insurance point of view, like I'm always thinking about these things like, Hey, if there's a claim on yep. my home, am I going to have enough coverage for this? Again, I do a lot of the podcast. I do a lot of the recording, the editing and all that kind of stuff, right? So like yep. I obviously have a lot of like computer equipment and electronics. So I want to make sure that, that my policy is going to be good enough for when, if there is something that happens. Again, knock on wood, nothing ever happens. But hey, you know, it's it's really only a, a like a clock on, the, on your desk until something happens. That's it's true. very rare that as a consumer, you go your whole life without making any insurance claims. So That's right. Yeah. When you want Everyone to make that claim, go through it. Exactly. When you want to make that claim, you want to make sure that you can call your broker and they can go, yep, check your, you're covered for that instead of, right. oh, you know what? Like we kind of shortcutted you a little bit to save you some money. And now you don't actually don't have coverage for that. That's the worst. I don't ever want to have that conversation with any of my clients ever. So yeah. now I guess the question I would have for that, and, and I, I'm, guessing the reason a lot of people maybe don't even go with that insurance or just maybe don't even know about it, but is it because is it expensive to get personal belongings? Like whether you're renting or you own the home? It's, it's not, it just, obviously there is an additional cost, right? Okay. Like, yeah. cause with a home, with a tenant package, like the, one of the biggest coverages will be contents. And okay. then obviously as you increase those content limits, your premium does go up. However, there's also a special coverage on your policy, which we call like floaters or scheduled items, where okay. there's special items that have increased limits to them. So like, for example, my mm. golf clubs, they should be on as a scheduled limit because they are X amount of dollars. My I fishing see. equipment should be scheduled items because they're X amount of dollars. If it's just general equipment and it's not over the limit that your insurance company 
offers, which again will yep. differ depending on the insurance company, you're yep. fine. But if it goes over that limit, you should be what we call scheduling it or putting on as a floater on your policy to make sure that it is going to be covered properly moving forward. Interesting. Okay. So it is definitely something to to revisit, I suppose, for people listening. If if you have it, if you've bought something that's fairly expensive in the re- last six or 12 months and you haven't updated your insurance policy, I would, I would recommend to change it. Yeah. I mean, the biggest, I, I always knew, sorry, go ahead. The biggest one we see is jewelry, obviously like engaged rings, wedding say. rings, that kind of stuff. That's, that's exactly the what biggest one we see because the, obviously those can get into the five, 10, even $20,000 range. So those yep. are like the biggest ones that we see schedule on policies. Again, I have clients that have paintings and artwork and, you know, for coats and again, not maybe not wedding jewelry, but like just jewelry in general they have. But again, mm-hmm. everyone's going to have their own little thing. Like I've had a client before that had a big collection of comic books and we had mm-hmm. to like list all of his comic books on there because they were like ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 worth of comic books. Wow. That's so huge. again, those are just things that obviously to keep aware of because yes, you might think as a policy holder, Hey, my never, my broker agent has never gone over this with me. And Hey, I have, Ten thousand dollars worth of golf clubs. Mm-hmm. Well, you should probably be having that conversation with your broker to say, "Hey, you know what? Like, what should we do about this? Right? Like, sure. what does my company offer me? And if it's not offering me enough, should we be looking at additional coverage within the policy as well?" Very cool. Now, when you go through, because I mean, thankfully, I've I've never actually had a client have this happen. But if there is a fire or a flood in somebody's home. Uh, and they, you underwrote the policy for them or helped them with the policy, do they call you or do they call the company directly? Uh, so for the claim situation, it can go through me. We don't deal with the claims internally. It goes like the claims department. I always okay. say to my clients just to make it obviously easier for them is to call me and then I'll get them in touch with the claims department. And then like kind of yep. from there, I mediate between them if I need yep. to. But again, our yep. claims department is normally very, very good. They do things very, very quickly, as quick as they possibly can. I normally don't have any issues with them. They are some of the best people in the industry. Um, and it's, and again, sometimes it has to also go to a third party, right? Depending on how big a claim is. If it's a massive claim, it yep. actually gets sent out to a third party um, inspector, uh, investigator, and all that kind of stuff. So that might take a little bit longer depending on how mm-hmm. big a claim is. But like I said, sure, normal claims, it's like I said, our claims department is the the best in the industry I've ever seen. So it's a, just an easy, Hey, you know what, John, you know, you had a fire in your home. Hey, I'll get you over to Susan. Susan will take care of you. And yep. they're, you know, like I said, first in class in any claims department I've ever, ever worked for. So literally nothing cool. but praise to say about them. That's great. Yeah. That's always good to hear, especially because when you're going through the insurance process, if you are doing a claim, it's obviously not a happy time. No matter really what happens, no, it's so, stressful. <laughs> it's exactly it's super stressful. Yeah, it's super stressful. Like I had one today. A gentleman, you know, he got sideswiped, and he was like, "Just he's like T- ten minutes ago, it just happened. Like I don't know what to do." And I'm like, "Hey, man, like I get it. It's stressful, but like let's just take a deep breath." You know what? At the end of the day, I always say this to people: it's a piece of metal. It's a piece of wood. Those things can get replaced. Now, if it's your life, well, we can't really replace that. So you know what? Let's just pray that those things didn't happen and you know we we walked away from this accident because this little piece of metal that's dented hey they're going to cut it out and replace it or you know what they're going to pull the dent out of it or hey they're going to repaint the fender like those things can be repaired but again you losing your life over something like that well that's a lot bigger of a concern we don't ever want to get to that point these other things they can easily be fixed absolutely yeah you losing a limb or getting injured or Whatever the case, as long as you're you're happy and and or you're healthy, I should say. Obviously, not going to be happy in that situation. But if no. as long as you're healthy, then then that's uh, the most important thing. Exactly. So, one yeah, thing I wanted to touch base on too is obviously we had this Bank of Canada rate announcement come out today. Nothing yep. really changed again. Obviously, right. not shocked. I know you're not shocked either. But not at all. Yeah. A funny thing that I saw that global news posted is that it said bank of Canada holds key rate, but signals June cut and in quotations puts realm of possibilities. So it's almost like they're pushing to say 
June might be cutting, but then also too, you said there are obviously other factors outside of the Bank of Canada that consumers should be also be looking at. Absolutely. So the the main indicators of of whether or not we're going to see a rate cut really comes down to two things: the inflation data and the unemployment data. When it comes to inflation, you want to see the inflation data on the decline. So we saw in February come down to two point eight percent from two point nine in January, which is great news. So that would be a, something that's starting to put pressure on the Bank of Canada to potentially reduce the rates. And then there's the unemployment. The unemployment, what you, the Bank of Canada wants to see is for the number to rise. Although, although obviously that's not great for Canadians, if less people are working, it means that there can be less people spending money and therefore inflation falling even more. So we saw unemployment go up to 6.1%. And I believe it was at 5.8% in January, so 6.1% in February. So again, another indicator, which is a positive news for the Bank of Canada, to potentially lower rates. So we didn't see any rate decrease this week, and they are having it in the realm of possibility for June. But my prediction as of this point is we will not see any rate decrease. And the reason for that is, first off, our inflation data falling and the unemployment going up is great, but it's still not a strong enough indicator that they have the ability to lower rates because they don't want inflation to spike back up. That coupled with the inflation data that came out of the United States this week, it's not looking like there's going to be any rate decrease. So in the United States, their inflation actually increased to 3.48% year over year from 3.15%. And a lot of people might not know this, but what the Federal Reserve does in the United States, the Bank of Canada follows very, very closely. And they have to follow closely because they have to, the Bank of Canada has to make sure that the Canadian dollar doesn't fall in value rapidly. And what I mean by that is if the United States lowers or raises rates and we don't follow suit, there's going to be an imbalance for, for the Canadian dollar. And so because they're having, the United States is having that inflation problem right now, they won't be reducing rates anytime soon. And therefore, really, Canada can't. So I think, um, I think yeah, there's the rental possibility, but unlikely. Oh, how, how people can afford groceries. How can people afford rent? How can people afford their insurance, right? Something has to give for people to go, oh, we can actually afford things and actually do things, right? So absolutely. Yes. Sorry about that, James. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Unfortunately, the, with the inflation, it's it's one of those things where the Bank of Canada does have minor control over it because of the interest rates. And so when you raise interest rates, you're going to cause people to stop spending as much because they don't want a, the cost of borrowing to go up. But at the same time, if, if people have good jobs and the unemployment rate remains relatively low, it means people can still spend. So the Bank of Canada can do as much as they want to do um, in terms of lowering or, or raising rates, but it's no guarantee that they're going to be able to control it 100%. So. Yeah, exactly. It's like we said back earlier in the podcast, it's, it's all about predictions, right? They're predicting what they see moving forward, but again, yeah. their predictions aren't always right. And like I kind of mentioned, the, I think the, the next the American election and the Canadian election is going to play a big part in all of this. I think yes. they're trying to stay status quo for now, just to kind of not ruffle a lot of feathers to kind of see, you know, one, who gets in the United States and two, 12 months after that, who gets in in Canada. And then from there, I think that's when things will start, you know, softening it up a little bit because yeah. and then you have new political leaders in place. You know, things are kind of stabilizing a little bit more. We're, like I said, yeah. we're kind of going into that time where if Biden doesn't get in again, he's out and then new ideas come in. You know, if right. the prime minister doesn't get in again, new prime minister comes in, new ideas, right? So there's a lot of Absolutely. these outer factors that I think a lot of people don't really take into consideration. They just go, Absolutely. oh, the rate's so high. We need to go down because we want to pay less. Well, yes, but there's also factors from the economical standpoint, but there's also political factors that, again, I don't think a lot of people consider when talking about really anything, yeah. right? There's Absolutely. not always just one and thing that impacts one everything so no and then, and then you're going to always have you know what, what are called black swan events that nobody could have predicted that are going to have a huge impact on the economy so like you said the 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 elections for one if the 
coming uh, the the incoming uh, administration, whether it be Canadian or American, has a complete opposite agenda than the central bank of that country, then the central bank doesn't have as much power as we really think they do, right? So, like you said, it, it, the American election is coming up in November. Whether or not whoever wins, if the administration is using a lot of money to stimulate the economy, well, that's just going to drive inflation up right there. Um, and so, yes, the bank, the Federal Reserve is going to try to combat it, but it's it's no guarantee. So there are there are a bunch of different factors. The, the biggest ones being uh, for for interest rates, at least the the inflation and unemployment but like you mentioned so many different things yeah and again it's, it's always a, a good idea to keep an eye out on everything because yes yep. like i said we can sit here and say oh banking canada is using that realm of possibilities right but again in two months from now those realm of possibilities could also change depending on like you said the black swan moments right so that's right i read an article the other day on i think it was toronto sun or toronto star uh whatever the the blue one and the article said, basically, the article title said there was a guaranteed rate cut coming in June. And then I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. And, and it said in, in the title, with math included, or like with the data, back it up. And I ended up looking at the data, and it, there's like no math included. And so it was just pure opinion. Yeah. Um, so you really have to watch out what you Love read. those articles. <laughs> like- yeah, because... <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, okay, so they know something I don't, and this is what I should be, you know, updating people with, but just nothing. So you really have to watch where, if somebody is predicting something, ask them why they think that, other than just an opinion. Uh, we really need to see some data on it, and in order to get an ac- accurate prediction and to be able to plan into the future, you want to have some data at least to back it up. It was like an article that I brought up a few weeks ago um, with the the insurance market changed recently where the government basically allowed their regulatory body to change coverages on the auto side of things. Uh, but then all the mainstream media was posting like, oh, it's going to save consumers money, blah, 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 blah. And, but I'm, I'm like, well, yes and no, because yes, you're saving money, but look at the coverages that you're cutting out to save that money. So it's like, they were pushing it out there to consumers like, oh, this is a great, great thing to happen. It saves people money. But let's look at the let's look behind the curtain a little bit. Right. Like, let's actually if it's saving people money. To your point, how is it saving people money? Oh, it's cutting coverages. Oh, OK. Well, is it really saving you money? Because long term, if these things happen to you in a claim situation, well, right. now what do you do? Right. And on top of right. that. Not every client qualifies for it because lenders and lessors of vehicles are still not going to approve you taking less coverage because technically you don't own that vehicle yet. If you're That's financing right. it, you're still paying payments. If you're leasing it, you're technically only renting it for a short period of time. So mm-hmm. those were things that were left out of the article. And again, it just made my blood boil because it was just like, yeah. you're, yes, you're kind of giving a little bit of the truth. But you're stretching the truth so much where it's like it's not even really that truthful anymore because there's also underlining facts that you didn't put into the article that people yes. are, are missing that, again, changes their opinion 110%. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that transparency just has to be there. Otherwise, you don't believe anything it, it sort of says. Even, uh, and I, I won't bring up politics too much, but, and I, I won't say, whether it's right or not, but the carbon tax, right? So the carbon tax is something where they introduced it to help combat climate change or whatever the case. But then they say the money is just going to be coming back to us. So why are you taking the money if you're just going to give it back to us? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it just like, feels like they just want to get their hands on it to do something else. But it's, it's to your point, it's just about the transparency. If you can just be transparent, whether it's in these articles, whether it's directly from the government, um, that way the Canadians can know what's actually going on. And it's not just, uh, it's not just a guessing game for the, for the Canadians. Well, it's funny you bring that up because they don't even know where it's going themselves because there's no, like, there's no <laughs> yeah. like record of it. And it's yeah. funny too, because I always bring it up to my girlfriend. Um, I saw like this, like meme, like months and months ago, and it always comes up like just randomly on my like time, yep. like my, my stories and stuff, sure, but it's sure. like, Oh, Canada has like 400 billion trees 
and to to use like to for basically the amount of trees it would take to like cut our emissions to zero is like 40 billion trees so there's 360 billion trees that are unemployed right now and it's just so funny to always look at it that way it's just like a funny little twist on it that really like you could cut 360 billion trees down but we would still have the same emissions it was just it's always just funny to see stuff like that because it's just you know it's kind of thinking outside the box and just you know poking a little bit of fun at things that are going on in our world right now which i think we need to have a lot more because i feel like a, a I, people are just concerned and i think when you kind of make a little bit a few jokes about certain things i think it yep. kind of lightens the mood a little bit but yeah it's yep. uh it's just funny it's just like yeah 360 billion trees are unemployed like we need to get them back to work <laughs> so <laughs> i never actually heard that one that's that's pretty good that's <laughs> it's true too yeah so i like i said i saw it months and months ago and like it just will randomly you know show up on my feed sometimes i'm like i like that one so yeah, yeah i'll have to share right. it next time with you once i see it so Sure, sure, that'd be great. So, but uh, moving forward, maybe let's say after June, right? Uh, like you, you've already kind of predicted you don't see a whole lot in June. Do you really yep. see anything else in 2024? Or do you think 2024 is just more of a status quo? The election in October, November, we go in 2025, our election in the fall time. Like, what do you see maybe in the next, let's say, 12 months going to 2025? Yeah, so... It, it is an interesting year because although there were at the beginning of the year, there was a lot of rate cuts expected. Oh, that was like the talk seen, of the town. Like we went was, to J- December and everyone was like, just like, Oh, here we go. Like 2024 yeah. is here. And like, we're going to start seeing rate cuts. And now we're, I can't believe four months in already. And yeah. there's been nothing. There's been nothing. Yeah. So first off, like you said, we were expecting all that stuff. Uh, but also what is weird is during an election year, especially in the United States, generally we start to see interest rates fall from wherever they are. And so because we haven't seen that, it's, it's sort of worrying. We might not see anything for the remainder of the year. If, and this is a big if, the data remains strong, which it's looking like it, it, it will remain strong at this point in time. We're not seeing any, any uh, breakages in unemployment, in, in uh, the the uh, uh, producer producer price inflation index. So if you're if you're seeing the data come out and it's starting to look worse and worse, that's one thing. But we haven't actually seen that. So yeah, to your point, we might not see any interest rate decreases yet. Obviously, being a a, a mortgage holder myself and trying to help our clients, I'd rather see interest rate decreases. But it's just not looking like that might be the case. When it comes to uh, real estate in general, real estate prices want to see interest rate decreases as much as possible, and so they want that election year sort of that election year truth to come to to happen. Because as interest rates fall, home prices tend to tend to go up. But we're not sure if that's going to happen. The Federal Reserve is still saying they're at least going to do two by the end of 2024, but they were saying four at the beginning of 2024. And we haven't seen anything. So it's it, time will tell, but my prediction would be we're at this point in time, unless any of those things change, we're not going to see anything. Maybe not a question for you, but how is real estate doing right now? Because I know it started off the year really cold. Obviously, yep. you know, people don't really buy in the winter. But yep. even for myself, like I'm just like kind of looking just, you know, just to look. And like even yep. from now, even since April started, I've seen like a massive influx of people wanting to sell their homes. So are we seeing just because the spring markets here, people are looking to sell our rates on the homes actually going down or like what kind of what, what are you, what's your take on that side of things? I know you guys aren't like directly impacted by it, like you yep. see that kind of stuff, but obviously with, with you working with mortgages, you obviously kind of see, you know, all this homes coming in at this and, and that, mm-hmm. right. So what's your kind of take on that on the side of the real estate thing? Yeah. So Obviously, I, we don't we don't study the the market data as much as a realtor would, but we do see the trends and we do see what our clients are doing. From from January until now, we've seen so many people want to get pre-approved interest because on. they feel like interest rates are falling, and it might not even be that. It might be people are just becoming comfortable with where the interest rates are, and so. We've pre-approved so many people up until this point, and it's just a matter of pulling the trigger. Some of them have, some of them haven't. 
Uh, some of them we're just planning to still going in the next six months, but I feel like the market is just going to stabilize the rest of this year, potentially gradually increase, but we're not going to see any 2021 or 2022 levels just because of those interest rates at this point in time. So yeah, the, the market is, it's, uh, people are still, even though they're a little bit more comfortable with the rates, they're still concerned and, and still holding on. There are a few of those clients too, who, who expect the, the great crash. I personally don't believe that will happen or will ever happen in the next five years. Even um, the great crash may have already happened from 2022 until 2024, where we saw home prices pretty much decline 18 to 20% in Hamilton specifically in Toronto. We saw similar that may have been the great crash because in Canada, residential real estate is over, I believe, 14% of our GDP. It actually just can't crash like people think it would. Otherwise, the Canadian economy really will be in a bad, bad place. And none of us want that to happen. So I don't think we're going to see any of that great crash. We might see ups and downs, but I think we're going to stabilize and gradually increase going from here. Do you ever see it going back to the times of like 1.5% mortgage rates? Or is that just kind of out of this realm well, now? We, we talked about Black Swan events before and COVID, COVID was a Black Swan event, right? That was one of those events where nobody knew what was going to happen. Like and the so eclipse the bank, on Monday, right? <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, eclipse the, over the economy. The eclipse, all the, all the electronics broke down. And Did you how get your talking glasses? On <laughs> how are we talking on this? Yeah, I don't um, know. <laughs> yeah, we had some. So uh, I don't think we're ever going to see 1.5% again. I mean, with that being said, we saw it in the first place, so it, it technically could happen again. It's just it, it, it led to too many problems with inflation that we just saw happen in the last 12 to 18 months. And I don't think Canada ever wants to see that happen again. So probably not. Yeah. And again, it, it's, it's tough, right? Cause like people, consumers obviously want to get back to that point. Cause it was like, great. Like, again, it was like printing money and like, you'd like, really, it was just free money at that point. It was so easy was to get a mortgage. Money. It was awesome. You know, people were buying left, right and center. It yep. was a great time, but Hey, you know what? With those great times also comes risks. And we kind of saw, Hey, you know, we kind of push the envelope, push the envelope, push the envelope, boom. COVID happens, the eclipse over the economy that we like to, I like to use now, I'll be using it moving <laughs> forward. Um, and hey, you know what? It pushed us right off this cliff in a 10,000 foot fall. And now we're like, whoa, whoa, like this is like, we have to like revert years and years and years of issues that we had. And people are like, oh, wait, I'm not really ready to do this. Yeah, ex exactly. Exactly. It, it eclipses the economy. <laughs> I think also is even you're going to start using that term now. Watch. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's I'm going to trademark it. that term. I think because that term is going to be the <laughs> term of 2024, the eclipse on the economy. <laughs> eclipse on the economy until the next one happens, which is yeah. I don't know, 14 years from now or something. And then so. I'll use the ice age of the economy. There we go. I'm already <laughs> trademarking that too, so don't use that either. So we went from the the the. Uh, uh, global temperature heating causing fires and bad news for James insurance yeah. to cooling and flooding and yeah. this is bad news. Yeah. <laughs> What's well, worse, fire or flood? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Take your pick. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, um, I, I, I think it did push the economy quite a bit higher. Uh, not sorry. The, I, I mean, when I say the economy, I mean well. First off, the economy actually did quite well after interest rates went down, but also push the real estate, the market to, to limits probably that were way overinflated, right? When you see a bubble, that was probably it. And it was just because so many people were, had the ability to buy with low interest rates. So many people wanted to buy and get a new home because they were stuck in their home, whether they were with uh, parents or they were renting or they were in a sm smaller home that they wanted to be in or they wanted to get a pool. And so all of that, lower interest rates, higher demand, lower supply led to massive, massive price growth. And this is sort of where we ended up. We've seen the fall off, like I said, 18 to 20% in, in the Hamilton area over the last 24 months. Uh, but I don't think we'll see huge growth in the next six to 12 months, at least not yet. 
is your always biggest thing when you're talking about mortgages is just get the pre-approval done? I know um, yep. I've, I've had consumers come to me, they buy a home and they're like, oh, do you know a mortgage person to work with? And I'm like, you bought the home and didn't get pre-approved? Like, it just, <laughs> it seems backwards to me. But from, a, from a, a mortgage expert like yourself, like, am I completely out of line or like, is a client completely out of line when they go and buy and they're not even approved yet? No, they should definitely be going to the the mortgage whoever their mortgage broker or mortgage agent is first that should actually be the first step because you don't even know what your maximum amount is and when i say you don't know what your maximum amount is people might actually be able to afford more than they thought right so you might be you might be thinking i don't want to get a pre-approval because i know it's going to come in low but you know it actually might come in high and so if if that house was six hundred thousand and you thought, oh, I could only afford 500, but you could actually afford 650, you may have won that bid on that house, right? And that's not the only reason to do a pre-approval, obviously, but it's one of the biggest reasons is to find your affordability. The second reason is we want to do pretty much like a, a full application for the pre-approval to give you an idea of where you stand with your credit score, verifying your income verifying the down payment because a lot of times you might think oh yeah my income's great but you're part-time and only been working three months uh, but you get a lot of overtime well, well we can't actually use a lot of that right and that's what the pre-approval is for to determine what we can use and then plan accordingly with you going forward so yeah they should definitely do the pre-approval first for those people who bought and didn't have a pre-approval um obviously go talk to alex go, i guess go come talk to me as soon as possible <laughs> because we have to see what we can do um but this way it just it just reduces the stress it reduces running into any any roadblocks uh, in the future yeah I, again i it just it, it blows my mind when people are like oh i bought the home but i don't have a mortgage set up yet and i'm just like i'm not a mortgage agent but i think that's the backwards way of doing things <laughs> yeah that's the uh i don't know i'm trying to think of uh, of a house analogy but that's the you try to start putting up the the, the drywall roof and everything, first. And the roof without actually doing the the, the foundation. Yeah. yeah, you know when when a little bit of water comes, your house falls over, or the wind right. blows and your house falls over. That's sort of the same same analogy there. Interesting. Yeah, it's um again, I think it's always important. To obviously, we be working with people that you can trust and will give you the honest opinion of things. And yep. Like you said, you might also be qualifying for a higher rate. You don't know that, right? Until you actually talk to someone that's an expert and can go through the numbers with you. And then again, I also think it's also a waste of your time too. Like if you're looking at homes for a million bucks and you can only afford 700,000, well, you're just spending time. And, you know, even a, from a real estate agent, like if you're, if they're giving you showings and stuff and you're really just not using your time wisely, if you're spent looking at something that's 300,000 over what you actually would qualify for, right? So yeah, no, Absolutely. The other thing is, too, is a lot of people, I, w I would say, overestimate what they can actually, what they actually make or what they actually afford. And we see this quite often. So people will say, I make 80000 And they come and show me their documents and uh, they actually make 60000 If you don't do the pre-approval, even if you did buy that house and now you're coming to me, we might not be able to get you approved regardless, right? And so you really have to to get that pre-approval first uh, to, to, to set that groundwork, right? So we've unfortunately seen that. There's also, you want to verify that we can, we can use your down payment. We have had situations where uh, people said they had a down payment. Once they actually showed us the documents, we're like, well, we can't actually use any of this because whether it, you know, they might have foreign funds or the funds might not on, have been on deposit for long enough uh, in your bank account, whatever the case, this, these are things that we know and that we see all the time. And that's why we can sort of guide you and lead you in the right direction. Which again, I think a lot of people need to have because it's again, it's a stressful time. It's just like buying a car, right? It's probably one of your biggest investments you're ever going to make. You want to yep. make sure you're making the right choices moving forward financially and obviously for your life choices as well. You don't yep. want to be going through it with someone. And then, like I said, it's just a transaction, right? I know knowing you for the last few years, I know it's not just a transaction for you. It's obviously a big moment in a lot of people's lives, probably one of their biggest, if not their biggest purchasing a property, a condo, right. a home, whatever it might be. So you want to make sure, you know, like you have all your ducks in the row so that when things 
like when we need to actually get down to business, like it, we know that we're in a good spot to, you know, get this house for you. You, you know, it might not be your dream home, but it might be, you know, your beginner home, your first time home buyer, whatever it might be. But hey, it gets you into the market. And I think that's what a lot of people right now are really striving to do, right? Exactly. Exactly. I think um, uh, whatever stage you're at, you, you want to have some sort of plan going forward and, and talking to insurance for your car is just as important to talking to, to myself for your mortgage. If you're going to buy the car, realize that the insurance monthly cost is going to have an effect on, on your cash flow for the month, right? But if you didn't know that up front, uh, you could run into to trouble later. So Exactly. It's always nice to obviously budget and make sure that you know what that budget is moving forward instead of getting that big shock factor of, oh my God, it's going to cost that much to insure. Oh, it's going to cut my mortgage is going to be that much every month, right? You want yeah. to make sure that you know before you can make an educated decision and go into it being, I feel comfortable with this and moving forward. Um, again, a home is not a short term thing. A car might be a little bit more of a short term thing, depending on what yeah. kind of car it is and, and budget and all that kind of stuff. But a home is probably not a short term investment. You're probably going to be in it for a no, few years. That's for sure. No. And, and we work with our clients, even, even if we start your pre approval today or, or your application today and, and we realize you can't buy right now, we plan accordingly for the next 6, 12, 18 months. And that's why we have our monthly newsletter. We follow up every month or two to three months just to see how things are going and, and what's changed, anything new as your situation uh, per, perhaps improved, have you built up that down payment. And then we, we go through the process until you do buy. And then after, the, after you buy, we continue uh, with updating you with those, those newsletters and following up, hey, how's the new home? Can we help with anything, et cetera? Well, kind of ending things off here. Again, we always end the podcast off with, I always I like to ask, What's the one thing you want to leave listeners with? If you could if you could just basically summarize this whole podcast with one point of view, what would your point of view be from this whole thing? Um there will be no interest rate decrease in June. <laughs> That's what I will say. <laughs> That's a good one. You don't want to use my clips over the economy analogy. Well, <laughs> I, I was gonna use that, but then I thought you were gonna use it, so I didn't yeah. double up on it. <laughs> <laughs> so no you, you're not you're not seeing any decreases at all no june no for sure i would say uh obviously anything could happen and i could be wrong there i highly doubt it and then for the rest of the year uh i'll give it a 25 percent chance i know the markets are giving it a little bit higher percent chance i think it's 80 percent that they'll see something this year i just uh ha happen to think the data is way too strong the economies are way too strong inflation's way too high in the united states so unlikely anything so well, to again, just sum the, up the episode the term of something right like what what is something you know what i mean like is something uh point per point one or like because again if, if you would tell consumers that they're probably like yeah who cares right yeah, i think a lot of yeah. consumers are like oh let's get it back down to two and it's never gonna happen right yeah so. yeah something would be generally they go by halves or point two fives Yep. So even if they did 2.25, you're only at half a percent down from the 7.2% uh, uh, prime rate. And so at that point, you're at 6.7%. Uh, you're still relatively high. Uh, we would need to see significant, significant decreases uh, in the interest rate for, I, I, I would say, for the real estate market to, to take off again. I'll ask you this question it might be a little bit off topic, but I saw this okay. uh, in December actually, but yep. um, I read that like over half of Americans don't pay off their mortgage in their lifetime. Is that true? I don't know if that's true. I I feel like just because the rules and stuff are different. Like I was reading the article and because like how the I, I rules like are and not. like how long their, their periods of time can be in their mortgage. Like they can go yeah. like, I think 30 plus years sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like the article was saying like over half of Americans in their lifetime will never pay off a mortgage because there's like really, but you no, know, maybe that, not now, but like maybe like five years ago when the mortgage rates were so half, low. Half do pay off. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I, I could believe that's that. I could believe yeah. that's that. I know in Canada, I believe that the stat is over half of households have no mortgage on the home, which is really hard to think about. but. 
it, it's true. A lot of baby boomer generation and above who own homes have no mortgages. Thankfully, that that puts them in a good spot. That's where you want to be when you're retired. But so yeah, I can believe that. I think my takeaway is obviously this eclipse over the economy thing. <laughs> Um, anything can really happen, but it's also important to be checking with your experts. And again, if it's an insurance expert, if it's a mortgage expert, if it's a real estate expert, just give them a five minute conversation say, you know what? Hey, like I was thinking about this over the weekend or, you know what, this, I read this and I would just kind of want to get your opinion on it. I don't think any expert on planet earth is ever going to tell you that's a dumb question. I think they're going to, they will run with that. Like I, I, I want the days where people just come to me and go, you know what, I saw one of your posts, or hey, I was reading this, what's your opinion on it? I'll take 10 minutes of my day, any time of the, any time of the week to say, hey, you know what, this is what I think, this is what I see coming down the road. And again, it's better to ask an expert than to just, you know, read one opinion, one point of view, and then go, oh, that's it, that's what I'm going to believe in, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. The experts aren't going to know everything, but what, what we do know is that we see a lot of data, we see a lot of information, and we can decipher through that information and sort of pull out the most important things that you should know. Because if you go on trading economics right now for Canadian data, you are going to find a lot of different indicators. <laughs> yep. and the fact of the matter is that a lot of those indicators have nothing to do with real estate. A lot of those indicators do have a lot to do with real estate. But if you don't know what to look for, you're just going to be looking for days and days and days because there's so much information. Um, and I've been there before. I've looked at that information. And again, a lot of it has nothing to do with what you're probably going to want to find. And that's why we're here to sort of figure that out for you. Ending things off, I want to thank Alex for coming on the, the podcast this month. Alex, where can they find this awesome James Bond updates every week? <laughs> yeah, so the James Bond yield update we do on our Instagram account, Tried and True Mortgages. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Tried and True Mortgages. And then also on our YouTube, uh, I believe it's just, uh, it might be just look up Tried and True Mortgages. It'll come up on YouTube as well. And uh, I, I do it personally on, on my account. And then we share it to the, to the Tried and True account for the Instagram. It's basically just a Monday to Friday bond yield update. Keep you informed about what's happening with interest rates. I love it. So I think everyone should take, give it a, a check. Um, I think it just, like I said, it just cuts to the point. It makes things super easy to understand. Like I said, from my perspective as a consumer, I've never really looked into it. And then you started doing it like six months ago. And I was like, wow, this is actually like really interesting. And like, it, again, it just simplifies things, which is nice, right? I just, people want things simplified. If I use insurance terms with you, you're going to have no idea what I'm talking about. It just yep. simplifying it and just I use the term plain English. If you can just For use sure. plain English with consumers, I think that goes a long way with people to be like, you know what, this person's actually down to earth. They're not just trying to, you know, pull the wool over my eye using very, you know, intense uh, terms that no one knows yeah, what you're talking about. Complex terminology. Yeah. We don't need to be that of those kind of people, right? So absolutely. absolutely. But Alex, I really appreciate you coming on, taking your time, giving your expert opinion on things. Thanks um, for having me. And Again, every time you use the word uh, eclipse of the economy, I'm going to be uh, billing you for that because that's now a trademark. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to reduce my usage on that one. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thanks, James. And congrats on the two years. Awesome. Thank you so much for you guys tuning in for the April edition of the Broker Breakdown. And we'll check you guys in May on the May episode of the Broker Breakdown.